Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the WVU Emergency Medicine Recording Studio. This is Joe Minardi, and today I'd like us to talk into a common topic that touches many specialties in the house of medicine, and that's upper and lower extremity DVT. Obviously, lower is a little more than upper, but I think with some of the skills we can learn from lower extremity DVT, we can translate those in to help us more efficiently and accurately diagnose upper extremity DVT as well. So here are our CME objectives, and which patient is a DVT ultrasound going to help us? How are we going to acquire those images? How are we going to recognize what's normal and abnormal? And then how are we going to incorporate this into the care of our patients? That's our general guideline for most of these applications and not much different here. So as usual, I like to often start out with a few cases that might be things that you might see on the floors, in the emergency department, in the ICU, or even in the clinic, depending on the setting and the scenario. This one is a 59-year-old man who's got arm swelling, history of renal cancer, and has a PICC line in place, and just has some arm swelling, really not much else going on, and we'll get back to these findings here eventually. Here's a 29-year-old female who's got leg pain and swelling, had a recent flight, and is on some oral contraceptive pills. Normal vital signs, otherwise looks pretty stable. A couple more cases these with no images, but this next case is a 23-year-old female who presents with left-sided chest pain. Blood pressure, heart rate don't look too terrible, pulse ox is okay. Patient's 37 weeks pregnant, so think about that a little bit more. How DVT ultrasound might help us in cases like this. The next one is a 58-year-old male who presents with acute shortness of breath and looks kind of sick, hypotensive, tachycardic and hypoxic. And this next one is a 62 year old female who's acutely short of breath. Blood pressure's pretty good, heart rate's a little on the high side, 112. A little hypoxic though on room air, 84%. And then but some other confounding factors here, other information to kind of digest and help us with our decision making is patient has a creatinine of 3.1 and a severe IV contrast allergy. With those cases as an introduction, let's talk into some of our topics here, point of care ultrasound for upper and lower extremity DVT. Now we're going to start with lower extremity and then we're going to talk about how we can translate the skills from lower extremity DVT over to looking for upper extremity as well. So here are the take home points. And we're gonna kind of repeat these often and loudly. First thing you do with any of these patients, upper or lower, is engage your brain first in assessing the clinical likelihood of DVT because that's gonna influence your decision-making, your ne next steps, and help you make sense of and incorporate the ultrasound findings altogether. When we do lower extremity DVT ultrasound, there are three deep venous junctions. And we're gonna talk about how to find those and recognize those. And very important to recognize is that all of the deep veins that we are very interested in and care the most about in the upper and the lower extremities always are touching arteries, okay? So if you don't see the deep arteries in contact with the veins that you're interested in, they're probably not the deep vein. Deep veins run with deep arteries in contact with. And the main thing we're gonna look for is just compression, yes or no. There are some scenarios where we may use Doppler or some other techniques to help us, but 95 or more percent of the time, compression, yes or no, is going to answer our clinical question and give us all the information we need to take care of our patients. So a little bit of background about why DVT ultrasound may help us and why we might do it. First off, DVT and venous thromboembolic disease is just common. Again, touches pretty much every specialty in medicine or most specialties in medicine. And if we can look for this and diagnose this at the bedside or even rule it out or suggest that it's clinically unlikely, we can save a lot of time, money, and resources. And with a little bit of practice, I'm going to show you that this is a pretty easy exam to complete on your own. So really, any patients with limb pain or swelling, in some scenarios, patients with signs or symptoms of pulmonary embolism as well. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. So this case would be pretty obvious. You probably don't even need an ultrasound to diagnose this one, uh, but you still like to confirm that with imaging. So just to dive into this a little bit, not a lot of detail, but DVT study as part of a PE workup. And when might this be adequate? And when can this answer your questions and you can move on? You don't even need pulmonary arterial imaging. So pregnant patients, patients with dye problems with like an allergy or significant kidney disease to where you don't want to give them IV contrast, or maybe they're too unstable to go over for a CT pulmonary angiogram. So those are some of the patients where we might think about this or where it may add useful information to our clinical scenario. Today our focus is on extremity DVT, but if we're thinking about working up pulmonary embolism in a patient who can't go for CT pulmonary angiogram for whatever reason, there's a couple of things we can do. We can look for the DVT on bedside ultrasound, but we also can add that to the information of right ventricular dilation on bedside echo. And there is literature identifying pulmonary infarcts in the lungs with point of care ultrasound. Gotta tell you, 
I haven't gotten good at this. I'm not really going to talk about it at all today, but I do want you to know that literature is out there and this is being incorporated in some centers, uh, but beyond what we're going to talk about today. So break it down to a really simple algorithm. If we have a patient where we suspect PE, but for some reason we're unable to confirm that definitively with pulmonary angiography or VQ scanning or whatever else we might do. If we look for DVT and we find it, then that increases the likelihood that the patient does have a pulmonary embolism and it supports going ahead and treating it. So if they're stable and we think we're just gonna treat them with kind of our run of the mill anticoagulants and we find a DVT, we can just treat them. We don't necessarily need to diagnose their pulmonary embolism if we already have a rationale for prolonged anticoagulant treatment. Maybe they're unstable or they can't go for pulmonary angiography. Maybe you see right ventricular dilation on bedside echo, and if you want further weight to increase the likelihood that you have the correct diagnosis, you see a source clot in their leg or their arm, then that may help support you in the difficult decision of administering systemic thrombolytics. If we think the patient has a pulmonary embolism and we look for DVT and we don't find one, then that supports withholding treatment or managing them in a more delayed fashion, maybe delaying, pre-treating so they can undergo pulmonary angiography or get a VQ scan, or maybe it's enough to decide along with the rest of the clinical likelihood, we don't need any other treatment. Again, none of these are gonna be definitive. They're either gonna increase your confidence or likelihood in providing treatment or a specific therapy, or they're gonna lower your threshold or likelihood or desire to provide that therapy. So with that, we'll talk a little bit more risk factors. I'm not going to belabor this. This is something that we all should be pretty familiar with. Stasis, injury, hypercoagulability. Estrogens are certainly can play a role. So we all know these. This is not the point here. Some of the reasons why these might happen. Talk a little bit about some of the literature. Generally, the summary of the literature. I'm not a big journal club review man. I think I try to review the literature and I trust all of you will review the literature on your own to try to verify or dispute some of the things that I'm saying if you feel the need. But I would give you my summary of the literature is that DVT ultrasound is easy, it's accurate. There is a little controversy on this, but if you do kind of the three point, more thorough, lower extremity DVT ultrasound that I'm gonna describe and that I teach our residents and our physicians, it may be equivalent to the comprehensive whole leg DVT ultrasound that sometimes is recommended or done. Again, there's probably controversy around that. I wouldn't say that's an absolute statement, but there is literature suggesting that's the case and guidelines that would also support that. Now we're gonna talk a lot about doing the ultrasound to diagnose DVT. Just remember, this should be part of a kind of whole patient approach. And the recommended way to go about this is history and physical, risk stratify them first, and most algorithms and most clinical guidelines would suggest doing a D-dimer first and then imaging selectively in patients who have a positive D-dimer. Now I would tell you where I work and where you work, it's possible that the D-dimer doesn't come back in 10 minutes or you don't have a point of care D-dimer. So I can often look for and diagnose or exclude DVT faster than I can get a D-dimer. So even though this is the recommended approach, I will tell you that in my practice, I think it's perfectly reasonable to say, this is easy, this is fast, this is efficient. I'm just gonna do the ultrasound of their leg or extremity first and not wait for a D-dimer. A lot of what we're gonna talk about and some of the decision-making we're gonna talk about comes from the American Society of Hematology guideline. The latest update that I have on record is 2018. And these are very similar, almost identical to, to what's been published by the American College of Chest Physicians. And what they will say is they really don't differentiate proximal leg ultrasound, which is what we're going to talk about. This is what we do at the point of care from a whole leg ultrasound. And they pretty much, at least in the guidelines and the evidence that is cited, they cite both of these as being pretty much equivalent. Now, I would certainly acknowledge that maybe that's controversial and not everyone would agree with that. But from a guideline perspective, from an evidence-based perspective, we can treat them as equivalent. Again, not without controversy, but that's the framework from which we're gonna approach our discussion. And just from the emergency medicine literature, which is very active in point of care ultrasound and DVT ultrasound specifically, this literature would suggest that a quality DVT point of care ultrasound for lower extremity is equivalent to the proximal leg ultrasound that is talked about in some of the other literature. When we get to that, we're not talking about a two-point ultrasound. And even though I talk about three points, it's not even a three-point ultrasound. I essentially am going to recommend that you make sure you hit the three points, but you follow the deep veins in the proximal leg as far as feasible. So just to talk a little bit about decision-making, so we can divide patients up into kind of low, moderate, or high likelihood for DVT. The recommended algorithm would suggest doing a D-dimer 
If the D-dimer is negative, then you're done. You don't need to do the ultrasound, but we're going to talk about ultrasound because that's our point today. If the D-dimer is not available or you've decided, I don't want to wait on a D-dimer, and you just move to the proximal or whole leg ultrasound, you'll see these guidelines are directly from the American Society of Hematology, and you'll see that they pretty much consider these ultrasound techniques to be equivalent. If either of these, the proximal or the whole leg ultrasound, is negative, then you're done. No lower extremity DVT. If it's positive, then you treat that. And then the moderate likelihood algorithm is pretty much the same. There's really not a lot of difference here. So here we do the same thing. If we have the positive D-dimer or decide maybe we've decided to forego the D-dimer, proximal or whole leg ultrasound, we're going to talk about proximal. If it's negative, then serial ultrasound may be undertaken. And we'll get to that in a second. If initial is negative and then serial ultrasound is negative. They don't have a DVT. If at any point they have a positive study, then that's definitive for DVT. And obviously if it's positive the first time, they have a DVT. Now, serial ultrasound means repeat in about a week. This is not repeat in 24 hours or 48 hours. This is someone that can be pretty much scheduled for a standard vascular lab ultrasound during regular business hours. These patients don't need to come back tomorrow morning or the next day because it was a Saturday. If you've done a quality proximal leg ultrasound like we're going to describe and you decide they're moderate or high likelihood and need serial ultrasound, that can be done sometime in the next week or so. And in the high likelihood patients, really not any different than the moderate likelihood, okay, as far as our decision making. So again, we'll see proximal, if it's positive at any point, so positive here or positive here, then we treat them as DVT. If it's negative and then negative again on the serial, which again is in a week, not the next day, then we they don't have a DVT and we don't need to treat them. So just to simplify this, assess their likelihood. If their likelihood is low and you do a quality point of care ultrasound and it's negative, you're done. You don't even need a serial or a follow-up. If they are moderate or high likelihood, and you have a negative point of care ultrasound, then they should have a repeat in a week. And I always also tell these patients, if you have new increasing worsening symptoms, then you should follow up sooner or be reevaluated. So that's the decision making. 